Nuestra siguiente charla, Catalina Bajiak, nos presenta uno de los proyectos del Fellowship Data Science for Social Good de verano 2023 en Carnegie Mellon y que comentó el doctor Gani en nuestra charla de apertura de este track. Este proyecto intenta anticipar las intervenciones necesarias para que una persona no caiga en situación de calle en el condado de Allegheny, en Pittsburgh, Pensilvania. Uh, so today I'm here to talk to you about this project on reducing entry into homelessness following eviction through predictive modeling, which is one of the projects that Raid Ghani talked about in the keynote this morning. And this was part of the Data Science for Social Good project uh, in 2022. And uh, I did this work with these wonderful collaborators on the screen and of course many more people behind the scenes helping. So you might think to yourself, what do eviction and homelessness, how do, they, how do these relate to each other? What are we really doing here? So let's start with some background. So in the United States, 3.6 million evictions are filed every single year. Now eviction can be a really disruptive event into people's lives, but there's one thing that can happen that's really, really horrible which is this eviction filing, if that person cannot secure alternate accommodation in time, can result in them falling in homelessness. And so when we look at um, Allegheny County in uh, Pennsylvania in the United States, which is where this project uh, was, was done, so this is where it is on the US map, this is a map of that area. And so here, these white dots, each of them represents one of the 13,000 evictions that were filed in this county alone in 2018. And here, I highlight those who fell into homelessness within one year of their eviction filing. So all eviction is not the only pathway into homelessness, it is a pretty important one. And so the question becomes, can we do something to make this pathway smaller, to, to reduce it? And to understand that, that question a little better, let's see what actually happens when somebody gets an eviction filed against them. So there's a landlord, the person who owns the property, that files an eviction against the tenant. And then within a couple of weeks, generally, that person, um, that case is taken to court, and most times, the tenant loses, the landlord wins, and it's decided that the tenant owes money to the landlord. And at least in the state of Pennsylvania, there is this law called pay and stay, which means that if I, as the tenant who has an eviction filed against me, if I pay the money that is deemed for, to be owed to the landlord, either for damages or overdue rent or whatever else, then I'm allowed to stay. But also the landlord within the three month period after that case was decided, they can file for something called an order for possession, which is basically the official legal document that allows them to kick that person out of their home. They can, file, they can file for this at any time, and once they have the paper, they can use it at any time. And we don't really know when that happens, but this three month period is really, really important to them, and the quicker they could pay their rent off, the more likely they can stay in the house. And so the local government, the Allegheny County Department of Human Services, or ACDHS, knows about this problem, and they already have an existing program to try to help people by giving them one-time rental assistance to help them pay off that eviction and hopefully stay in their house, and then they don't end up falling into homelessness. But the problem is that, uh, or, or the idea is that they, they give it in this time frame, right? But the problem is you don't know whether that person has already been evicted or not, if you're later month in the three month period or not, but this can still kind of help. And the general way that this works is that there is a phone number that you need to call, you need to know to call, and you call, and if they determine you're eligible, then they'll put you on a wait list. Sometimes you wait weeks, sometimes you wait months. And uh, when you're at the top of the wait list, they will try to give you rental assistance. Maybe it's too late, maybe it's not, and that's a big problem. And the second problem is that there are a lot of people who are also facing eviction, who might need this help, but for whatever reason don't call, either because they don't know or because they think that they won't be able to be helped because they hear about other negative experiences. And when we look at the people who end up actually falling into homelessness, it could be true that many of them never called in to help. And so the idea behind our project was, how about we try to prioritize rental assistance to the people who need it the most, regardless of whether they're calling in or not, and can we do this in a data-driven way? So we're trying to switch from being active 
to more proactive, just looking at the people who are facing eviction and trying to help those most at risk, and you know, using data science to do that. And so um, ACDHS not only has this rental assistance program, but they have a lot of other programs, and on top of that, a lot of data about the residents. And they've done a lot of work to take data from different sources and combine it together. So in terms of counties, they actually have one of the best data warehouses, as they call it, uh, of, of any county in the United States, at least. And they're pretty organized in that sense. So the idea here is that given a person facing the eviction, we can use their data to try to predict who is most likely to fall into homelessness. And what we're going to do is create a list every month of the top 100 people that we think are most likely to fall into homelessness because Allegheny County thinks they can help about 100 people a month, right? This is a limited resources problem. And then we can apply the intervention to those people. And so the bulk of our work was done on this prediction phase, but of course, that's influenced by the data because that's before it and uh, by the intervention after it. So all of these things are tied together. And so just to talk a little bit more about the kind of data that we actually have, here are some pretty prevalent examples. So first off, we have a lot of data about these people's evictions. And it could be the eviction you know, that they're facing now, or it could be also evictions in the past. So for each eviction, we know when the case was filed. We know how much the landlord claimed that they were owed. We know uh, when that case was actually decided, what happened, and how much the judge actually decided they were owed. And then we also know that if an order for possession was filed, when that happened. We don't know when that person was actually kicked out of their home. That data, unfortunately, just doesn't exist. It's, it's not written anywhere systematically. But then we also know a lot of other program interactions. So as I mentioned before, ACDHS does a lot of different types of um, And this includes things like homelessness shelters, or being on Medicaid, or food assistance, or various other programs. And then finally, we have some information about residents' mental and physical health. So if they've had mental health crises in the past, uh, we know when those happened and what type of things they were. If they got diagnosed with a mental health disorder, we know what that is. And we also know the date and duration of their emergency room visits. And so with all of this data, we want to build a model. But what do we need to do? Well, there's a few steps. The first one is to figure out the cohort, which means who are we actually trying to run this algorithm on? Who are we going to be training and predicting on? And then did they fall into homelessness or not? So how can we figure out this? Then we're going to extract features, right? The data as itself, you can't just throw that into a model. You need to do a lot of work to process it so that it's in, in the language that a model can understand. And then what we do is we train a huge series of models, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And uh, you know, there, there can be thousands of them. And we evaluate all of them. And we see, well, which ones are performing well and which ones aren't. And finally, based on those results, we can select a model that we think is best. And so we're going to talk about all of these steps now in greater detail. So first, we're going to talk about the cohort. So let's say that I plan to run this algorithm on January 1st, 2019, or something like that. You have a particular date. There are some really important uh, uh, time frames before and after that date, which are the four months before and the 12 months after. And these will define our cohort and labels. So for looking at the cohort, which is who and, and when, right? we want to look for people who have either had an eviction filed or lost in the four months before when we'd have planned to run that model. And we also want to make sure that they're not currently homeless. First off, because our intervention is for homelessness prevention. And second off, because we'd be kind of cheating. Because if you're homeless now, it's really likely you're going to be homeless in the future. And then secondly, um, the label is just uh, uh, in the next 12 months, we want to see if they use homelessness services. So that's why the second time period is important. So what we end up with is at a person, a person at a particular time, we have this big table of, of those people. And then we know whether they fell into homelessness from the 12 months following that time. So then secondly, there's a lot of different things that we're extracting. And I'll go through it kind of quickly. But uh, we have three kinds. The first are global features, which are just 
the overall trends, you know, how are, uh, how are the trends of eviction? How are the trends of homelessness? This is trying to account for seasonality in our data. We see that uh, there's a lot more activity in homelessness shelters and things like that in the winter months because Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania is very cold. Um, then there's static features about people, which could be things like the number of interactions they've had with a particular program, the number of evictions, things like that or a category like what type of mental health visit or diagnosis do they have? And then also some demographics. And finally, we have some features that are trying to capture time, trying to capture if they're having more trouble now than they were before. So for example, are they having more evictions in the, in the last year versus the last five years? Uh, what's the number of days since their most recent eviction? And have they, if they've had subsequent evictions, are the time between them really, really small? Because that might mean they're more at risk. And so then what we do is we actually, like I said, train a series of models. And you can look up all of these models on your own time, right? Um, but they're just very standard models that will give us um, some sort of score. And we do that with a lot of different parameters. So all of these models have different knobs that you can tweak. And based on that, you can get wildly different results. And that's how you end up with thousands and thousands of models, because it's all combinations of these numbers. And these models will just give you a score for each person at a particular time. And we take the 100 highest scores, and we say those are the people likely to fall into homelessness, and the rest not. And so um, our evaluation is kind of this, this temporal idea where we, we want to use the information known by the analysis state. So we're only using information uh, you know, before, right? Because we can't see peek into the future in a realistic scenario. And then we evaluate with uh, the time afterwards. And we do this at a lot of different time frames. So you can do this for every single month in the last five years, for example. And then when we evaluate, well, what do we want to compare against? So there's three things that we think are baselines that make sense. The first one is trying to figure out what the current practice is. And while we don't have access to the waitlist data, this is pretty similar to looking for people who are furthest along in the eviction case and giving them money. That's a good proxy for that. Previous homelessness. Um, so if they've been recently homeless in the past, they're more likely to be homeless in the future. So you look at those most recently homeless, but again, that are not currently homeless, and you prioritize them. And then also just some sort of random baseline. So uh, there's about 2% of people facing eviction will end up falling to homelessness. Randomly select 2% of them. And if you don't do better than that, then you have a real problem with your, with your model. And essentially, the, what we want to be looking for are efficiency, effectiveness, and equity. And what I mean by those things, efficiency is how correct am I, right? I give you a list of 100 people. How many of them actually fell into homelessness? And you can measure that with precision at 100. Then secondly, I want to be looking at the effectiveness. Of all the people that fall into homelessness, am I reaching a lot of them? And that's recall at 100. Not equity goal, you want to look at the demographics of who is in this list. Am I prioritizing, for example, white men over uh, white women, over you know, black people, over all of these demographics? You want to make sure that you're not doing something that's going to be um, inequitable. And so, you know, there's a table of results here, and you can stare at it for a while, but I'm just going to, you know, point out some, something that I think is really interesting. So first off, the blue highlighted rows are the models that we performed pretty well. What I think is really interesting is looking at the baselines. So the current process is pretty much as good as random, which is unfortunate, but it's true because these pro it's really hard to figure out who's going to fall into homelessness on a case-by-case -case basis. But if they just look at previous homelessness, without doing any sort of fancy machine learning, you can already do a lot better. Now, there's a problem with that that we'll talk about in a second. There's a reason that we still choose to use models, and they also perform still better. But that was interesting to us. And then when we look at equity, I know this is a lot of plots in front of your face. But the idea here is um, the horizontal axis here is, let's say that I have more or less resources to help people. How does the recall change when I do that? So the more people I help, the more people I'm, that I'm going to catch falling into homelessness. So this is always going to increase. right? If I give rental assistance to everyone, then I'm going to capture everyone who, who would have fallen into homelessness, for example. So some interesting things that I want to point out here is for the baseline uh, previously homeless, this bottom plot here is showing the difference between people who have been homeless before and people who have not been homeless before. 
since you're only looking, the baseline only looks at people who have actually been homeless before, you're really bad at capturing first time homelessness. So this would have actually not be a good thing to implement. And then we see that the other three models, generally across race and gender and previous homelessness, perform kind of similarly. But we do like that LGBM, when you look at the really small range, which is the range in which we're going to be most of the time because we have very limited resources, there is not disproportionate impact uh, between men and women. And later on, it actually prioritizes women over men. And that's something that we're OK with. And so we felt like LGBM did pretty good of our criteria. And so that's the one that, that we recommended to ACDHS to use. But something else that I think is really cool and important about the results, we're figuring out what are the telltale signs? What were the features that were most important? And these three cropped up over and over again. The first one is the number of homelessness spells and their overall duration. And that makes sense because if you've been homeless before, you're likely to be homeless again, as I've mentioned. The second one is if you've had recent and often mental health crises, those features would show up again and again. And finally, and weirdly enough, the medical assistance transportation program. What is that? Um, there are people who are not very mobile who need to be taken to their doctor's appointments, and there's a program to help you do that. And because this is kind of encoding some sort of maybe like some sort of disability, or maybe you can't uh, take certain jobs because of that, it's somehow uh, encoding some sort of risk, which I thought was really interesting. And so I've hidden something from you entirely, which is that all of the things that, that uh, all these results are pre-pandemic. Now, why did that happen? Well, we did this fellowship in summer 2022. And between March 2020 and October 2021, there was a moratorium on evictions, meaning that you couldn't file evictions because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And then you say, OK, but between 2021 and 2022, there was time what gives. Well, in order to evaluate, we need to wait 12 months to see which people fall into homelessness or not. So before October 2022, we can't really do very much. And uh, so as of the summer, we couldn't do much. But we did do a little, little bit of, of analysis later. And what I can tell you, right, this is um, precision at 100 over the years. And you can see the eviction moratorium there. We basically just have one data point where the evictions had risen back to pre-pandemic levels. And that one data point looks good, but we have to wait and see. So things are possibly promising, but I can't, I can't say for sure. And that's where future evaluation will come in, in, in the continuation of this project. There's a few other things that I want to mention, which are the first one is that we talk about right and wrong predictions. But what's really going on here? Uh, we chose 12 months as, as the duration to look for when people fall into homelessness, but that was a design decision. We could have chosen all sorts of different times. And if you look in the next three years, about half of people selected by our best model in 2019 would have so even if you're wrong, these people are vulnerable and they could use the help. So it's not like you're doing a bad thing. Um, the second thing is that we're really thinking about is, is rental assistance always the best thing to do? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Um, maybe some people need health outreach or maybe some other programs, maybe job training, or maybe they need longer term programs. And we just don't, uh, we don't think that rent one time rental assistance is the only solution but it's where there was a program that we could go in and change the process. And then we've had conversations with ACDHS about, well, maybe we should expand this. And we're hoping that that will happen down the line. Now, I want to talk about one tricky bit, which a lot of people will come across, which is data leakage. So I was telling you before about this validation and that we don't want to use information from the future, right? So when we evaluate, we say, well, pretend I ran the algorithm on January 1st, 2018, and, and generated a list of 100 people. But when I actually got the data was much later than that. I have more recent data. And the question always is, when did that data get updated? Sometimes you know that information. Sometimes you don't. And you kind of have to make the best guess. And it's a problem if you use information from the future, because in the real world, when they run you know, next month, say, if they were to run the algorithm, you won't have that information from the future. And if we use that in our models, then we can pretend our performance is really, really good when maybe that's not actually true. So we try to avoid this as much as possible, but we can't promise that it never, ever happens because the state of 
data is that it's messy and you don't always know when things are if people don't keep a record of when everything was updated. And so basically, if the data is here, you're fine. If the data is over here, you're not fine. And then I want to talk quickly about the next steps, right? I've, I've mentioned that maybe with COVID, things might work or might not work, though we're optimistic. Oh, sorry about that. And so we're going to run a field trial to find out the answers to two questions. The first being, does having this list of the top 100 people actually work in the future? And the second being, is the intervention itself effective? Because if we actually see that even though we gave rental assistance to a lot of people, they fell into homelessness anyway, then maybe we need to go back and figure out a different intervention, like I was saying earlier. So I just want to thank everyone for listening, and I'm happy to answer any questions. And again, these are all my lovely collaborators that this work could not have been done without them. So.